this time on Fifth Gear. It's David versus Goliath. Can Alfa Romeo's new super saloon possibly compete with one of the all-time greats from Mercedes-Benz? I'm going to have to fight dirty with this one. It's so aggressive. Engineer and custom car builder Jimmy DeVille shows us how to make the rally legend that is the Subaru Impreza even better. Something like this. It's gorgeous. Johnny Smith tries to convert three London taxi drivers with a revolutionary new black cab. This thing is a dedicated electric car. The team are joined by snooker legend Ronnie O'Sullivan to give the latest offering from DS the once-over. She's taking this really serious. <laughs> and if you love super saloons but are on a budget, Vicky tests three bargain German buys. If you want to put your foot down and have some fun, it will do that big time. Am I lucky or am I lucky? A day with two tyre-shredding super saloons. One is from those ingenious Germans at Mercedes. And the other one, well, it's a rather saucy little number from Italy. It's called the Quadrifolia, which will be the last time I'll be saying that today. So all I now need is another driver. And you'll do. Charming. So, which one do I drive? Well, you look vaguely Germanic, so you can have the Merc. Anyway, no introductions. Hello, I'm Jason Plato. The cars, you idiot. Uh, uh. Well, if he won't give the spec, allow me. The 4-litre V8 of Mercedes' venerable C63 AMG kicks out 510 horsepower in this ultimate S version. So I'm definitely in the right car. Super Saloon pedigrees don't get much better than this. Alfa Romeo haven't made a decent contender in this sector for over 20 years, but this souped-up version of the Julia model might just change all that. It, too, has 510 horsepower, but from a much smaller 2.9-litre V6 twin-turbo. And it's nine grand cheaper. Now, normally, I wouldn't dare take on the Merc in an Alfa, but I have a hunch this could be closer than you think. Let the challenges begin. So, test one, agility. The crucial speed of reaction attributes which provide the fun factor. Right, so Tiff's got five slaloms to do. He's then got to get the car up to 100 miles an hour and then stop it. And I reckon he's going to stop it probably right now. About there. Whoever completes the challenge in the shortest distance wins. Right, I've got exactly the same power as JP, but I've got a fair bit more torque. 700 Newton metres to his 600. However, my 0 to 62 time is just a tenth of a second slower. Neither of us have got those optional ceramic brakes. The stopping should be pretty equal. We're leaving both the cars in just comfort mode, standard road driving, so traction's on. Oh, but a wheel spin. Right, here he comes. Secret now to get through this slalom with as much speed as possible so we can get to 100 as quick as possible, says the exit at the last cone that really matters. Go, oh, come on, bit of traction controls. Help the engine back. 95, 100 miles an hour. Brake, 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 brake. <laughs> What's he doing? I got that wrong, didn't I? What on earth is he doing back there? Did you do that on purpose? What? Make me walk all this way. Well, you underestimated. It looks to take a long time to slow down this. Well, they're big, heavy cars. Nice stuff. I thought it was good through the slalom. I think I'm going to beat this, because that looks heavy. Well, go on, then. Go on, then. Have you got me Mark? So I'm not leaving this here, because you'll drive into it. Right, my turn. So I'm down on talk, but what really matters is Tiff's Lardy Merc tips the scales at just over 1,700 kilograms, you know, 1.7 tonne. Now, this Alpha's got more aluminium, more carbon fibre and a much smaller engine. It's a whopping 200 kilograms lighter. I quite fancy me for chances. Come on! Oh, you fight. 
turn. Oh, she's got good front end. Come on, come on. 50, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. One. Well, we'll call that a win then, shall we? Tiff's walking off set. I think you find my reaction times are just a bit faster than you, old boy. Oh, come here. Not walking that far. Isn't that amazing? I've remembered something. What's that? I forgot about weight. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. flipping 200 flings. 200 kilograms. You were, you were in sport mode or anything, no N cheating. For, N for normal. Uh, and it was exactly 100 miles an hour. That is much bigger than I thought. I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? So, surprisingly, it's 1-0 to the young pretender. Join us later when things turn a bit smoky and the Merc has the chance to reassert its authority. Now, a fifth gear team test. Our chance to get a quick first look and first impression of a brand new car. And this week, we've got a special guest in snooker ace and self-confessed petrol head, Ronnie O'Sullivan. So this time, the team tested the DS Crossback 7. With prices starting at £28,000, the Crossback is aimed squarely at the premium SUV sector to take on the likes of Range Rover Evoque, Audi Q5 and Jaguar E-Pace. There's a range of petrol and diesel engines, and this version we're looking at is the Prestige PT225, with a price tag of nearly 40 grand. How nice is this? I like it. I really got excited by it. This is the... Ci ci I was going to say Citroen, no, but it's no, no, not. No, no. It's the DS7 Crossback. Yeah. Where's a Citroen? It's not. And who makes DSs? It's Citroen. 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 Right. Yeah. It's a Citroen to me. I mean, this grill, I mean, all of it. Do you not like that? I love the grill. No. I, I really like the styling from the front. It's, it's best really fit. Love bold it. and yeah. muscular. I, like yep. I seem to rather disagree with the rest of the team. <laughs> Glaring chrome plastic. Tiff didn't like the plastic on it. Come and have a look at this, look. Yep. Oh, look at that. <gasps> disco lights. Yeah. Nice. yeah, disco lights. I know it's a bit novelty, but I quite like that. Those headlights are... Do we need those? Well, come and have a look at the back. All right. And when you get to the back, that's when the car really struck me as being a real good-looking car. These SUVs can sometimes be a bit too big. I like this. It's sort of seems proportionate. It's a compact it's SUV. It's quite nice at the back. It's got a nice bit. Oh, of it's so really well styled. The front and the rear are fantastic. The profile, I'm not so keen about. Well, I'll just, I'll just look, look at you straight then, because yeah. yeah, it's not good, is it? <laughs> Should we get in? Come on, get it and touch. The interior is a feast for your eyes. It's got a premium feel. It's got leather everywhere. What do you think? Isn't it luxurious? I didn't like the inside either. It's the same tacky plastic on the outside as coming. I don't mind, the, I do don't mind it on the tacky? outside. I love the design. I wish it was proper metal. I just think it was a bit too busy. A lot of different effects in there. Mm, love clocks. One thing I did like, though, was the reclining back seats. And they Flash. stole it off the Maybach. Nice little extra. I rarely see that. Now, there is a really sexy thing about this car, other than its design. What is it? It's got a super trick suspension. Oh! Time for a quick test. To test the ride quality of the DS, we strapped a tank of water to its roof and tested it against a rival, the Audi Q5. Even though it's not badged as a Citroen, the DS has certainly tapped into the brand's heritage when it comes to finding innovative ways of ensuring a smooth ride. This time, it's got something called an active suspension scanning system. There's a little camera behind the rear view mirror and sensors everywhere, and it looks at the road and then adjusts yeah. the suspension accordingly. It's obviously a very scientific test. I found it a little bit difficult not to be competitive. She's taking this really serious. I've got a cunning plan. <laughs> So this is a test of the cars. It's a highly scientific test, Victoria. Yeah, but I'm still... I've got to be competitive. <laughs> Heaven forbid I couldn't be beaten in any kind of car test by some sort of bloke who pots some balls. Do you know what I mean? I can't let Ronnie O'Sullivan spill less water than me. But his car might have a better ride. And looking at Vicky behind... Yeah. She's losing a lot of water, to be fair. Smooth over them bumps. Oh, well, it's been oh, too oh, soon. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> G 
you know what? The ride quality is very good. It is smooth in here, isn't it? It is smooth, yeah. It's very supple. It absorbs all the bumps, which is great, actually. It's also very quiet. Just lost the load on that last bit. Uh, we got, we got, what we got? I think you've got what? Yes, the DS has lost more water, but Tiff has a theory on that. It rolled more, so it pitched the water, but it didn't vibrate through the seat, the bumps, the little shock shocks. This was all bumped yeah. up, but it's like I'm in a ripple road, because yeah. that was very smooth. Ah, so it seems the DS's clever suspension does make it more comfortable than the Audi. I think we'll call that a win then, Ronnie. Scores, please. DS's first real car in this market. Tough sector they're going for. I'm going to be f fair, I think, on the car. I'm going to give it a cheeky five. So if I'm to give this a score out of ten, I'm going to give it a six. I'm going to give the Citroen, <laughs> the DS7, six. I'll give the DS7 a four. So that rapid roundup gives the DS7 Crossback a team test score of 21 out of 40. <laughs> Still to come, all hail Johnny Smith, cos he's driving a brand-new black cab. You might not put any fuel in it for days and days at a time. And Jimmy DeVille shows us how to make a Subaru Impreza even hotter by making it cooler. You'll see. And I know that that engine is getting so much more fresh, cool air. Today, I'm going to drive a type of car that almost all of us have travelled in, but hardly any of us have ever owned. I'm talking about those black cabs. Around 21,000 of them circulate the London streets on a daily basis. And in the 70 years since they came to the capital, they haven't changed much. Until now, because now a revolution is taking place. It represents the biggest technological step forward in the industry since the car replaced the horse and cart. So why is a revolution needed? Well, because London has some of the highest levels of air pollution of any city anywhere in the world. Researchers concluded that 80% of this pollution is caused by traffic, of which 20% are black cabs. Up until this point, virtually all black cabs have been powered by something called a diesel engine, some of which were reliable, none of which were economical, and we now know pretty polluted. So, in an effort to get polluting diesel cabs off the road, the London Electric Vehicle Company have come up with this. This is called the LEVCTX. Massively catchy name, isn't it? But that's not relevant. What is relevant is what's underneath here, because this is a completely electric black cab. And it's not before time, frankly. It is not before time. So what are the first impressions? Well, predictably, it's the silence. It's so quiet in here, you can pick up on all sorts of little noises. You can hear the electric power steering going, Woo! And obviously you can hear the compressor for the air conditioning, because I've got that on low, because it's the hottest day of the year today. But normally you hear that real clatter of diesel. The previous model, the TX4, was introduced in 1997, so it's now well over 20 years old. I've driven a TX4 for one day, and I had to have chiropractic treatment afterwards. It was appalling. This, by contrast, is quiet and comfortable and feels modern and cutting edge. This thing is a ground-up new car, built as a dedicated electric car, so lots of batteries in the floor, the construction is bonded aluminium, so it uses aerospace glue to put this car together. So it's lighter, it's more rigid. Inside, there's a real feel of quality and familiarity. Because a lot of the stuff I can see around me is from a Volvo. And it's derived from Volvo because Volvo is part of the same company that owns the London Electric Vehicle Company. It's so relaxing, I love it. But it doesn't matter what I think about the car. It's what cabbies think that matters. Between them, Alex, Tom and Ricky have clocked up over 35 years on London streets. So it's fair to say they'll have the knowledge. What do you think? I think it looks amazing. The TX4s that we've been driving previously looked quite old-fashioned. 
Now, this looks like something that we could be really excited about. I, I like the fact they've kept with a bit of tradition, but, you know, people would look, look at that as it drives past, and I think it's got a bit of a the wow factor. And I'm presuming this is where you would plug it in on the street, next to the headlights there? The... Yes, yeah, okay. there's a, there's, that flap opens up and it yeah. gives you um, three different choices of plug. The cab has a basic range of 80 miles, but it can recharge to 80% capacity in just 25 minutes if it's hooked up to a fast charge outlet. So, first things first, six-seater, three here, three here, and there's a big space here for wheelchair access. Ramp comes out of here, the side's all built in. Down there is a three-pin plug for your laptop so I can rob power off you while I'm travelling in your vehicle. And then you've got two USB chargers, um, so, yeah, come and have a sit-in. Come and have a sit-in. See what you think. It certainly feels bigger than, than my, my taxi. This Does it? Yeah, it is. It's far more comfortable. comfortable. The height is something else as well. It just makes it feel more airy. But does the new cab retain the old one's famous turning circle? It keeps going and it keeps going. That's quite go good, yeah. It's a proper lock. In fact, the LEVC has exactly the same turning circle as the TX4 at 8.5 metres. How does it feel in terms of the comfort level? It's really smooth and really comfortable. It's much more quiet in here than it is in a normal CX. Great for passengers, then. But these guys will have to make a living driving one of these things thousands and thousands of miles. Happily, under the bonnet is a 1500cc petrol range extender engine, which, unlike in a hybrid vehicle, doesn't drive the wheels, but acts like a generator topping up the batteries. This takes the potential range to over 300 miles and it gives you a number of options. I've got three choices. I've got Smart, Save and Pure EV. I'm in Smart and Smart basically chooses when I use battery and when the generator kicks in. Now, we're driving around town and I've still got lots of battery charge, so it's never going to let the generator kick in. In save mode, the guys could commute into London using the range extender engine to keep the batteries constantly topped up before switching to pure EV mode to drive pollution-free in the city. You know, they reckon you'll save £100 a week. Depending on how clever you are with your journeys, you might not put any fuel in it for days and days at a time. This new cab seems to tick a lot of boxes. However, there is a downside, because it costs £60,000. That's about 25 grand more than the old diesel model. That's the problem, though. If there's a real drive for there not to be diesel cars anymore in central London, then there should be more support for cab drivers to be able to buy these vehicles. Yeah. yeah. It seems it could be the answer, but it's still a gamble. Yeah. It's a really big ask. Yeah. So, after a quick spin around London, will these three cabbies be investing in the new cab? Best bits are the safety and the comfort by a mile. This is probably the cab I will purchase. I think at this stage I will wait it out and just see how these taxis deal with the challenges that come their way on London streets. I think I'm going for an electric taxi. In fact, Alex has now placed his order, and you get the feeling the other 20,000 London cabbies won't be far behind. Time for the second round of our dogfight challenge to see if the new super saloon from Alfa Romeo, the Quadrifoglio, which is Italian for four-leaf clover, by the way, can get the better of the legendary Mercedes C63 AMG. In the first test, the Alfa's 200 kilogram weight advantage made it much more agile than the Merc. So it's one nil to me. So let's move on to a test where the AMG Mercs used to excel. A drifting competition. Loads of smoke. Drifting is an excellent test of how well the chassis and power delivery combine on the absolute limit. And the heavier the car, the more momentum you can generate when trying to get the back end to break away. When it comes to drifting, the extra weight of this Mercedes won't be such a handicap, whereas the extra torque I've got will be a great help in spinning up those rear wheels. I'm ready to show Potato a thing or two. We'll both get three goes to record our best run, and to ensure a fair result, three of Angles' track team will award scores out of five. 
So, with all the driving safety settings turned off, let run one commence. A drift requires an aggressive turn-in, followed by the perfect amount of power to keep the car from spinning. Oh. Just warming the tyres up. So, the Alpha's got uh, active suspension in uh, dynamic and race mode, where it can tighten up the dampers, which will make the car really reactive. When you're trying to fling the car one way and then the other to get it sideways, being heavy creates a helpful pendulum effect. The problem is, the Alpha is, of course, a bit of a lightweight, so it doesn't have the same swing as the Merc. Not that good. What scores have we got? What scores? Are you blind? Are those welding glasses you've got on there? Run two for the Merc and... Oh, gosh. Almost too much already. Not bad. Well, if that doesn't please the team in orange, nothing will. Oh, well, they're hard to please. Well, what's the two? Oh, you can't just change the score in the middle. Oh! Oi, Jason. You dare challenge the judges? They started knocking points off. Uh, I'm going to be quiet now. I'm not going to say a word. Run two for me, and the agile alpha was definitely responding to a bit more aggression. What scores have we got now? Oh, they're going up. Thank you very much, thank you. Right, last chance for the Merc to show who's boss. I'm sure those lovely judges will like that. I love the judges. I love you. You're lovely, I love you. You don't get any more points for loving them. Right, turn it, you've got a challenge on your hands. Three fours. You're gonna have to do something special now, boy. The, the, problem, the problem I've got is if I do if I try and do a Scandi flick, there's a layer of ESP on this car, it just grabs hold of a front brake and stops the flick. It turns into other things. Excuses. Excuses. I'm now racking the brakes to see how excuses. I can, excuses. How I can excuses. fire it in. And there's no handbrake either. Excuses. I can flick it with that. Excuses. Any more excuses to come before you fail? Yeah, I've got a bit of indigestion. Right, come on then, fish face. OK, let's forget all about subtle driving skills and just go banzo. <laughs> and no, that wasn't pretty. I was a bit of an octopus there. But do you know what? That that might that might produce a better score. It shouldn't, because that wasn't my best. I was a bit out of control. Oh, do you know what? It's a better score. Judge in the middle, did I mention how lovely you're looking today? My charm offensive had failed, and I'd lost a tiff by a single point, which I thought was pretty good, actually, considering C63s are known for being tail happy. So the Alpha won on agility, but the Merc's the better drifter. Join us later for the decider, a flat out race. Fair play, you stinker. <laughs> Coming up, custom car modder Jimmy DeVille shows a simple fix to make the legendary Subaru Impreza go even faster. And hearing that turbo whistle is an absolute joy. And Vicky helps you choose a bargain super saloon. German muscle. <sighs> Delicious. Now it's time for custom car builder and all-round mechanical marvel, Jimmy DeVille, who's going to share the secret of how to upgrade the performance of your car from the comfort of your garage. I'm Jimmy DeVille, and I've dedicated my life to doing mad things with engines. I've built absolutely everything from Ford Escort rally cars to muscle car capris. I'm going to demonstrate how anyone can transform the performance, handling or comfort of their car with a few basic tools and a few hours of their time. First up, a proper rally legend, the Subaru Impreza WRX. These four-wheel drive weapons are every grown-up boy racer's dream, have won three World Rally Championships and can be bought second-hand for as little as £3,000. 
and now I'm going to make this 2001 model even faster by helping it breathe more easily. What I love about Impreza's is that engine. Those pistons punching left to right rather than up and down in more standard engines gives an absolutely incredible noise, something like this. The Impreza has an unusual boxer engine, which means the pistons don't move vertically, but horizontally. As well as its distinctive noise, the flattened layout means it has a lower centre of gravity, which helps with handling. And top WRX models are turbocharged for extra power, but I can help this one make even more. Turbos increase power by forcing more air into the engine, and more oxygen makes for better combustion. However, it helps if that air is cool, because cooler air is denser, packing more oxygen into a smaller volume than warmer air. The bit of kit that does this is a type of radiator called an intercooler. And this is kind of how it works. These bars are like empty tubes, and these little squiggly bits, they're fins. Now, the tubes have got the air in it that we want to cool, and so that heat from that air is dissipated into these fins, which, because they're squiggly, make a large surface area. So that air coming in through that top vent and pushing through dissipates that heat, cooling it, meaning it compresses it, and we can get more from our turbo into our cylinders. But there's a problem with intercoolers, which is shared by many cars, and certainly this Subaru. To be honest, the intercooler in a Subaru isn't in the best of locations because it's sat above the engine and the exhaust, which is always heating it up. Also, because of its location in this very packed engine bay, it can only be quite a small size. So today, I'm going to replace it and I'm move it to a better location, which is going to give this engine way more performance. And that new location is at the front of the car, where there's a lot more cooler air. This work is best done with a spare pair of hands. Mine are called Paul. There are five basic stages to the job. A couple of bolts at the sides and front, and the old intercoolers off in a couple of minutes. Next, it's time to make space for the new one. This is the most labour-intensive bit of the fix, because it involves removing the front bumper, and that involves locating a number of small plastic clips and screws. These plastic clips are a real pain. you just got to take your time and slowly ease them out. Nevertheless, while a bit fiddly, modern bumpers are usually light, so removing them is not physically demanding. We are now ready to start fitting the new parts. This is my old intercooler and this is my new one. And as you can see, this one is like twice the size. But not only that, this one is the colour black, and the colour black dissipates heat a lot quicker. So this intercooler is going to give me way more air cooling, and that is going to give my car more brum brum. The new intercooler fits onto a custom-shaped bracket and is securely bolted into place. It also comes with quite a lot of pipe work, and installing that means removing the air filter, which gives us another opportunity to improve performance. Now, this is a job you can do to pretty much any vehicle. Now let's have a look at the old air filter which came out of the air box. This air filter is made of paper and its job is to allow air into the engine but stop debris going in which would destroy it. But it's a little bit like running with your hand over your mouth. <laughs> kind of difficult. Whereas the new uprated air filter is made of fabric with a wire mesh, it still stops debris going in but allows more air in. And that conical shape has a greater surface area which directs a better flow of air. The new filter pushes onto the air intake pipe and is secured with a clip. As we've moved the intercooler, we need a whole lot of pipe work to connect it up to the turbocharger, but it still only requires some pretty basic tools. Like the rest of the intercooler kit, the pipe work is designed specifically for this car and will vary depending on what model you've got, but it's fairly easy to see where it all connects up. However, there are videos online if you need more guidance with this stage. When you're connecting a whole load of hoses like this, it's really important that you just keep them all loose and get them all on, and then when you're happy everything's in the right location, tighten it all up. The final job is to cut away a little bit of bumper so that it fits properly around the intercooler. Trimming the bumper down was a little bit fiddly, but now it's time to get it back on. You ready, Paul? Yep. All in all, the job took around three hours to complete, 
and cost under £300 in parts. But just how much has this modification improved the Subaru? Right, now that the engine's running, let me show you the difference I've just made. This is an infrared thermometer. And if I point it and read the temperature at the engine at the position that intercooler was before, it reads 85 degrees Celsius. Now, if I point it at the position of the new intercooler there at the front, it's only reading 45 degrees Celsius. Now that's a temperature difference of 40 degrees and that's gonna make a whole heap of difference to the performance of the engine and the turbo. In fact, a temperature reduction of one degree Celsius of the air entering the turbo equates to an increase of about one horsepower. So this simple job could easily up the power of the Subaru by some 40 horsepower. I tell you what, for a 17 year old car, it feels like it's just come out of the factory. Hearing that turbo whistle is an absolute joy. And I know that that engine is getting so much more fresh, cool air than it was this morning. This thing goes like a rocket. Earlier in the show, Tiff and Jason introduced us to two new super saloons and are on a mission to find out which is best. Nice work if you can get it. However, not everyone has 60 to 70,000 pounds burning a hole in their pocket. So what are the choices if you want a car with similar performance, but for less than a fifth of the price? How about these three for starters? I reckon these are among the best used performance saloons for around 10 grand. The BMW M5. The Mercedes E55 AMG and the Audi RS6. Together, you are looking at over 1,300 brake horsepower of German muscle. <sighs> Delicious. Each brilliantly packages practicality, performance and style. So let's get into the detail. If you're going to single out three second-hand super saloons worth paying attention to, then one of them has got to have an M badge on its rear. This E60 version was made from 2005 to 2010. At £66,000, it wasn't cheap, but you certainly weren't shortchanged on power because its V10 motor puts out 507 brake horsepower, enough to propel it to 62 miles an hour in 4.7 seconds. Its top speed is officially limited to 155 miles an hour, but you can get that limiter taken off, in which case this bruiser of a machine will go on to 200 miles an hour and beyond. And in fact, at one stage, it was the world's fastest saloon car. The chassis is wonderful, the engine is phenomenal. If you want to pootle around, it's very comfortable, but if you want to put your foot down and have some fun, it will do that big time. So, if you fancy one, what must you look out for? The hardware that makes up the seven-speed automatic gearbox is sturdy enough, but the software can become glitchy. A reset can solve the problem, but occasionally a complete shutdown will occur, costing you £6,000. A red cog warning light on the dashboard is the first sign of a second mortgage. Stopping a car that weighs almost two tonnes and goes like a rocket eats brakes. And a new set of pads and discs will set you back around £2,000, so check them carefully. The M5 can be an assault on your senses, but don't worry, you will have time to collect your thoughts at the petrol station. Expect around 16 mpg if driven carefully. Next, the Mercedes. From one iconic tuning division to another, AMG. Now, there's a hand-built engine under the bonnet with a fantastic voice. Just listen. And you would be forgiven for buying this car on that alone. These W211 models were built between 2003 and 2006. They have 469 brake horsepower, which gives this car an identical 0 to 62 time as the BMW, 4.7 seconds. But top speed here is 180. 
It's not as athletic as the M5 to drive, and it hasn't quite got that terrific steering feel, but you have got oodles and oodles of torque, and if you want a car to smoke tyres in, this is the one. So what can go wrong? The E55 has self-levelling air suspension and a pump to keep that air going. However, the airbags can develop leaks and therefore overwork the pump and then the pump can fail. Now, to check your system, leave the car overnight and in the morning see if any of the corners have dropped more than the others. And there's another pump-related problem. Mercedes cars of this era have a clever pump that maintains an even pressure in the brake line. Now, in early models, this could fail after two to 300,000 presses, so make sure that your car has had that rectified in the recall. And finally, the Audi RS6. This model, made between 2002 and 2004, is the oldest car here, but that's because that RS badge is so desirable, you have to go back a bit further to get one for around 10 grand. Rapid acceleration and slow depreciation means this has to be one of the options. Under my right foot is 444 brake horsepower generated from a 4.2-litre V8 twin-turbo engine. Does it sound as good as the AMG? No. The Audi has considerably less power than the Merc or BMW, but weighs about the same. And yet it gets to 62 in exactly the same time. Is this a sleight of hand, you ask? No, it is simple maths. Like most Audis, this RS6 has got four-wheel drive, and the more wheels you've got putting the power down, the more grip you've got, and everything that the engine can give you goes down onto the tarmac. The suspension is more taut than in the other two, so it doesn't quite give that relaxed comfort. And also, it lacks that intimacy that the rear-wheel drive cars can give you. However, it is a phenomenal straight-line monster. What to look for? Well, a tow hook, for starters. Hauling a caravan around will heat up the oil in the engine and transmission systems, and RS6s don't like that. Would you like to know the cost of an engine replacement? No, you don't. And the intercoolers can leak, and if the leak is big enough, then the turbos can fail, and that's another bill you don't want to know about. If you bought all of these cars new all together about 13 to 15 years ago, then they would have set you back the thick end of £200,000. Today, you can buy all three for less than half the price of the Alpha Quadrifoglio Jason's been driving. Which one do I want to get? This one. Why? Well, I've always had a soft spot for the M badge. For me, it's a combination of performance and handling that is a pretty perfect package. After the break, it's the deciding round of the epic heavyweight contest between the young punk Alpha Quadrifoglio and the establishment champion, the Mercedes AMG C63. It's one round each so far, so there's only one way to separate them. A flat-out race. Oh, I'm having a go. No! Oh. Welcome back to Fifth Gear and our Mercedes versus Alpha Super Saloon Challenge. Although Alpha haven't properly contested this sector for years, my little quadrifolio is putting up quite a fight. Now, so far we've learned that the Alpha is quite a bit better when it comes to a bit of ducking and diving. Yeah, but the Mercedes <laughs> provided the extra grunt and chassis balance to pull off a classier drift. True, which is all important stuff when you're considering sticking your hand in your pocket to lay out 60 grand on a new motor. But the ultimate challenge for any high-performance car is how quick it is around a track. Time for a race-off. We've got two laps of the track to determine which is the faster car and the overall winner of today's contest. All right, so it always needs to start. This is going to be tricky. I've got to get into the first corner ahead. Wheels, big wheels, big. Oh! I've got him. Oh, he's got the line. Is he going to be cunning? He's trying to get ready outside of it. He won't, he won't get that. I'm going to play dirty. Just, just, 
push him out. What is he like? So aggressive. I'm going to have to fight Berkey with this one. Let's see if I can get him on the exit. You've got to get the power down. That's not so good, Tiff. Oh, I've got a bit of pace on him now. Run, run, talk, talk. Down the long back straight, the Merc's superior pulling power just manages to hold off the Alpha. <laughs> that sorted him out. But approaching the slowest corner on the track means I can break later due to my car's lighter weight. Oh, I'm having a go. 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 No! Oh. He's died for me. <laughs> That'll learn him. He's a little light nimble. <laughs> He's oversteering, all right? Tell you what, that Merc's very tricky to drive. And I've got to really drive on a knife edge. Whereas this, it's got a nice little balance on it. In fact, the Alpha has a perfect 50-50 weight distribution. A really great front end. Just get closer to it. Very pointy. The car's torque vectoring system throws power to the rear wheel with the most grip. And to aid front downforce, there's an active aero splitter which activates at 62 miles an hour. I'll have to defend. He's coming. He's going to block me, but this corner is called banking because it's got banking. <laughs> He's having a go. You can sometimes just about make it. Round the outside. Fair play, you stinker. <laughs> I've got the line. He was brave round the outside then, the boy. Oh. <laughs> Do you know what? There's not a lot in it down the straight. Although the AMG engine is over a litre bigger than the Alphas, it revs a fraction higher, which means I can accelerate that bit longer before changing gear. I'm just going to block the flipping lightweight. Oh, well, he's going to block now. Now we can't get by. He's gone right in the defensive. Running wide. Oh, a bit wide. Block him again. Let's try and outfox him here. As long as I play dirty, he's not going to get me. Oh, can I get a cop out? Can I get inside him? <laughs> oh, I'm about to break myself. Oh, he's made a mistake there. I've gone a bit wide. I'm getting a bit of a mess now. Right, so I'm going to get the switch back when he's not watching. I've lost touch. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No! No! <laughs> he wasn't ready for that. I think the lighter, more nimble car is going to win in the end. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I was having to fight dirty. I had to play as dirty as a touring <laughs> car driver. <laughs> Well, I thought, I thought I saw you blocking car. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that, mind. Well, round the bank. Yeah, I, know, I wasn't I just, expecting I've that. Been there before that was once. a good move, but I saw you block at the end of the straight, and I thought, right, I'll just try and get you out foxed, and you just couldn't get the power in. Well, that you? looks lovely. It's got a little understeer in. A little bit can, in. You can get on the power early. But if you're brave and get on the power, you can make it... Yeah. You can go from understeer into a nice slide. It's good. It's a great little car, actually. I've still got the three-pointed star move on it, though. I've still got the Mercedes image. Yeah, but this is a faster car. And, Goodbye. what, £9,000 cheaper? It's been decades since Alfa Romeo produced a sports saloon worthy of their name. And then, out of the blue, the Quadrifoglio comes along. And it's not just good, it's flipping brilliant. Who'd have thought it?